Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Bill Marimo, and um, I'm a former colleague of Mark Bowden's. And um, I want to spend a little time talking about Mark's life and career, particularly his life, because it has some bearing on the book we're about to discuss. So um, bear with me. And um, first of all, um, Mark, um, since I have my notes here, yep. This is the most dutiful interviewer in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I remember interviewing a corrupt police officer with you. That's right. I, I remember Franklin that too. Franklin Plaza Hotel. He had great shoes. Circa 1984. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, um, I want to tell you a story to start out. And this is a story about um, a great inquirer reporter and writer named Mike Ruane. And um, Mike, um, and I had lunch the other day, and I asked him a question. I said, um, who was the best editor you had at the Philadelphia Inquirer? He thought about it, he said, um, Mark Bowden. <laughs> and Mark was on the city desk for a brief time as an assistant city editor. And um, you know, Mike said that every story he gave to Mark got better. And I, I mention this because I've always believed that Mark is one of the most versatile reporters and writers that you'll find. Um, Mark spent his early childhood in Glen Ellyn, Illinois. And at the age of 13, he arrived in Timonium, Maryland. And Timonium's a suburb in Baltimore County, about 10 or 12 miles from Sandtown, Winchester, where his new book, Life Sentence, takes place. His first newspaper job was the Baltimore News American, which wasn't too far from Sandtown, Winchester, which was a, when Mark joined it, was a very mediocre newspaper, which didn't have any place for the kind of writing but, and but reporting <laughs> that Mark wanted to do. And um, this book, this book um, Life Sentence, is dedicated to a man named Stan Heisler, who was then the editor of Baltimore Magazine, who gave Mark a chance to write the kind of narrative stories that um, distinguished his career at the Inquirer and often formed the backbone or foundation for his books. Um, we first crossed paths at the Inquirer in November 1979 when Mark made his debut writing a story on Election Day about the people who didn't vote. <laughs> and if you read it, you'll find that the reasons they didn't vote have a lot to do with the reason people aren't voting today inertia, a dislike of the candidates, and um, a, a stress about the state of democracy. At the Inquirer, I got to know Mark um, in several ways. We were racquetball rivals, we were softball teammates, and um, he was a prodigious hitter, a <laughs> slugger, even against the fraternal order of police. And we also worked together on stories about police corruption, shared bylines and ideas. I also got to know Mark's wife, Gail. Gail, where are you? There you are. Uh, and Gail was um, a terrific colleague. Um, she ran the Inquirer's library. And um, I would say that every uh, staff writer who worked with Gail uh, had, his, had their stories improved, just like Mike Ruane's. She was an A-plus researcher, a great leader, and a terrific colleague. So Gail, thanks for being here. <laughs> Most of us um, know Mark as a best-selling author, and um, he's written Black Hawk Down, which was the number one book on the uh, bestseller list. He's written books about the Battle of Way, and even um, Joey Coyle, the South Philadelphian who uh, discovered $1.2 million that had been dropped out of a, um, a of a truck. An armored car. An armored car. As <laughs> and it forgot was. to lock the door. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so I wanted to read um, a paragraph from Mark's new book, which is about um, a young man named Tana, who is a gang leader and the most prolific killer in Baltimore history, because it really summarizes for me uh, what this is all about, and I highly recommend the book to you. It's um, a graphic and sad story. And this is about what they call the game and how it entraps young people in the city. 
and I believe that there's an analogy between life in Baltimore and life in Philadelphia. The issue, writes Mark, was a Gordian knot with diverse contributing strands, poverty, poor education, drugs, guns, broken families, a violence-promoting pop culture, and inadequate policing. Where might one begin to undo the consequences of more than a century of subjugation, neglect, and enforced isolation to address the defiant subculture that had taken root? It's not that no one had tried. Baltimore's gun violence had withstood decades of well-meaning but poorly funded social outreach, some of which had inadvertently made things wrong, like replacing slums with modern high-rise apartment buildings in the 50s, or enabling residents to find jobs and better housing, only to see them flee and leave their old neighborhoods further depressed. Police crackdowns, periodically in vogue, and mass incarceration had fed deep-seated community hostility without making a dent. Drug sweeps actually increased shootings. Children of those arrested were more, more often left parentless, like Tana and his siblings, making them more likely to fall into the game. It was an infernal cycle. The most recent horrifying surge in Baltimore shootings, much of it centered in Sandtown, had happened over the very years of that enormous public-private effort to turn the neighborhood around. So Mark, to start us off, tell us how a, an Inquirer staff writer on Election Day, November 1979, made the transition into writing books. Well, thank you, <clears throat> first of all, for that wonderfully generous introduction, Bill. I appreciate it. Um, you know, I always had a, a um, secret agenda as a newspaper reporter. I, I never really wanted to be a newspaper reporter. I uh, <laughs> always wanted to write books. And, you know, I had been an English major in college and was very inspired by the new journalism of the late 60s, early 70s. And I wanted to do that. And so the, when I got a job at a newspaper, I thought, well, it's not doing exactly what I want, but it's a step in the right direction. And I actually ended up falling in love with working for newspapers, which made me a better reporter, made me a reporter, period, made me a better writer, uh, and ended up you know, at the Philadelphia Inquirer surrounded by just amazingly talented colleagues, uh, editors, fellow reporters, who I learned so much from. Easily the most important professional break of my life was being hired by the Inquirer. Um, but that old ambition was still there, and even as I enjoyed the daily newspaper work I was doing, I always had a story that I was working on on my own, on the side. I remember one time when I first started at the Enquirer, Doug Robinson was the city editor, and I would disappear from the newsroom uh, sometimes for hours at a time, uh, and he wouldn't know where I was and what I was doing, and I guess he just assumed I was out goofing off, which was probably a fair assumption, but I, I actually was always working on a story, and as it happened on this, I was working on the story about a, a little retarded girl who had been abandoned by her mother in her home in West Philly. And her, her, she had been discovered, this little girl, by a kid who broke into the apartment to steal things. And he found this little kid, and her name was Kim Bowie. And, and so the city arrested the mother and charged her with um, attempted murder and a whole raft of terrible charges. And I, I have a daughter who's disabled, and I noted that this little girl was 12 years old. So what that said to me was, somebody took care of that child, and that's not an easy thing you know, for 12 years. So what happened here? Why did this break down the way it did? And it turned out to be, a, I think, a, probably one of the best early stories that I ever did at the Enquirer. And I remember Doug apologized to me. He came up to me in the newsroom and he said, I'm sorry I gave you such a hard time. I didn't know you were doing that. <clears throat> and he wasn't particularly happy that I wasn't devoting all my time <laughs> to my city desk job, but he gave me a little more uh, credit after that, so. But the, the, to further answer your question, it just, I always was drawn to deeper, longer uh, stories. It, it always seemed to me when I wrote a story for the paper that I was just scratching at the surface 
of the story. I learned just enough to know that there was a lot more you know, going on here that I didn't understand and that might be really interesting. So gradually, you know, the paper gave me the license to do longer stories, to spend more time. I ended up on the Sunday Magazine staff. Then I was writing magazine-length stories. Soon I was writing magazine serials. Uh, you mentioned Joey Coyle. That was a serial in the Philadelphia Inquirer magazine. Uh, and by that point, <clears throat> I'm basically writing books. So it was just getting somebody willing to give me a contract uh, to do that. And I, I eventually managed to pull that off. And Mark, um, in terms of book writing versus newspaper writing, what, what are the additional skills you need to produce a book like Life Sentence or Black Hawk Down? Um, I think the, you know, the reporters I worked with at the paper, yourself included, were in many cases better reporters than me. And uh, so they're, they, they're all perfectly capable of doing book length work. But I think that um, not everybody is cut out to staying with the same story and not writing, you know, the, the way that I'm willing to do. Um, newspaper reporters, if they don't see their byline, every couple of days they start to panic you know they think they're going to get fired or something and and so i had maybe a little less uh i was too cocky to worry that much about it but uh but i i think it's that and then i think a big part of it is um organizational skills and i learned that as an editor working with you and we're with all the reporters who i edited like like mike ruane who was never a problem and not the least bit difficult to edit but some of the reporters that I worked with really struggled to organize the material that they had gathered in a day or in, over a couple of days and figure out how to shape that into a uh, readable story. And that was something I could help them with. Uh, but it occurred to me that, why is this so hard for them? You know? And so that if I have something that I guess a lot of others don't have is a capacity to in just a tremendous amount of information and figure out how to organize it in a way so that I can tell a story. Good. Um, thinking about TANA and life sentence, um, you're a Baltimorean originally, mm -hmm. and um, you worked there as a reporter. You went there, to, went to college at Loyola. Um, tell me about your views of the differences and similarities between Philadelphia where you lived and worked, mm -hmm. and Baltimore, where you lived and worked. All right, well, I'll, I'll take a shot at that, and then I want you to take a shot I'll, at it, too. Bill I, also worked as the editor of the Baltimore Sun for, for a while, so he knows that city well, too. Um, I think, you know, for me, the big transition coming to Philadelphia was just the enormity. What struck me is the enormity of the city. Philadelphia is four to five times the size of Baltimore. It's a far more urban city than Baltimore is. Baltimore, when you get to know it, is more than any other city I know, a collection of very distinct neighborhoods, oftentimes neighborhoods with this particular ethnic flavor. Uh, so in some ways, it's, it's really more of an old-fashioned city. Philadelphia is, you know, when I first came here, it was like dizzying to me. <laughs> you know, the, the, tr the level of traffic, just the, the enormity of the, of the thing. And I think also because of the way Baltimore and Baltimore County are constructed. Baltimore is a um, very southern city in the sense that it is strictly segregated. And so I could grow up in a neighborhood of, in Timonium, 10 miles from Sandtown, and graduate with almost 600 classmates in 1969, of whom two or three were, were black. And 10 miles away, the exact inverse was the truth. And that remains true to a large extent even today. I think in Philadelphia, many more people live in the city than in Baltimore. There are a few, like Bolton Hill and Guilford and Charles Village, a few sort of uh, white neighborhoods in, in, in Baltimore that have hung on for a long time. But m there's much more of a, of a mix of, of uh, people and not quite the same stark segregation that I saw in Baltimore. So those are some of my initial observations anyway. Well, they uh, jive with mine. And um, I, I would say a couple things about Baltimore. 
um, in Maryland also. Um, number one, I think it's um, more provincial than Philadelphia. There's sort of an insularity about it. Um, people uh, grow up there. Many of them stay there. Um, they take great pride in the city. Uh, they have their myths, like the day the cults went out of town in the dark of night. Yeah. <laughs> and um, they don't forget those things. The other thing I noticed, which um, I thought was a stark contrast to Philadelphia, was the um, relative, what I'll call, uh, docileness of politics there. In Philadelphia, when you have a political brawl, um, two Democrats going at it the way uh, Frank Rizzo and Pete Camille did in their heyday, it is a knockdown, drag out, fight to the death. In Baltimore, what I noticed is everyone puts up their fists, they threaten each other, and then they make they compromise. And there's never any bloodshed. And so those are the things that I'm, I thought about, provincialism, staying there, and um, the relative docility. Better um, sports teams here, too. <laughs> that's true, and more of them. <laughs> but I, I can remember um, when my wife Diane taught in Baltimore County schools, um, everyone loved Baltimore County. And when someone left and came back, they felt like they'd gone to heaven. So um, th those are my thoughts, Mark, about the difference. Um, in terms of the book itself, um, one thing I liked about the book was that it wove the personal story of Tana, some of the gang members and gang leaders, along with um, what I'll call social and political commentary, an effort to really understand um, how things deteriorated to such a level, and whether there was any hope. So I'd be interested in your thoughts on people like, in fact, I have a passage I want to read about Tana that gives everyone a sense of um, what he was like. Let's see if I can find it. This is um, the observation of another gang leader who was watching Tana as he grew up. And he, this, I really like this. This is great. Thanks. He'd watched Tana grow up one of the kids on the block who had sometimes followed him around in years past. Pony had gone to school with Tana's mother, Annette, and had even hung around with her a little before she began, as he put it, quote, dibbing and dabbing, close quotes, in the product. He had known Tana's father, a big, jovial Jamaican dude, before he got arrested and deported back home. He knew church going Dolores, that's the sister, Mark? Is that's the grandmother. Grandmother. Yeah. And that Tana had been mocked as a church kid. Pony had admired how the boy, even when very small, had always held his own out on the block, cheerful and smart, with a quiet dignity that belied his situation. Proud, surprisingly poised, always dribbling a basketball. In his school years, Tana had often sat with Pony in the mornings before shouldering his backpack and heading off to classes and then returned in the afternoon. The kid was the same age as some of Ponyhead's own. Pony had an avuncular feeling for him. But now the kid had developed swagger, especially since his older half-brother, Rel, had been busted and sent away. Tana had assumed leadership of their little drug operation. So how does a guy that Pony describes as the kid with his backpack dribbling a basketball turn into a murderer a yeah. year after high school? Yeah, I mean, that's what I set out to try to understand. I mean, the phenomenon of uh, uh, urban black violence, usually young black men shooting at other young black men, um, <clears throat> is happening in every big city in the country, not just in... Baltimore, it happens in Philadelphia, the Inquirer is doing, I think, a particularly good job right now covering the carnage in the city. Um, and so this has always been a thing because it's foreign to my own experience, and yet I only lived 10 miles away from Sandtown. I thought this would be an opportunity for me to answer just that question. And what I found was that it, it takes longer than a paragraph or two to explain. <laughs> But first, there's the long history of Baltimore, which, as I said, is an extremely segregated city where these neighborhoods like Sandtown, uh, which are basically ghettos, 
were very deliberately created and enforced. And so you have concentrated poverty. Uh, you have the, the poorest schools uh, in the state. Uh, so the, the education uh, avenue out is more difficult. Very few opportunities for kids growing up. Um, and you have the presence of just an astonishing level of violence, which I describe in the book as being as familiar to kids growing up in Sandtown as ice cream trucks were to me growing up in Timonium, Maryland. I mean, all of these kids, Tana included, had seen friends, older brothers, cousins shot down on the street. I mean, the, 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 the view of somebody who is, who is their body has been torn apart bleeding on the sidewalk is a common occurrence. If, if I saw something like that, it would be a traumatic experience, even at my age, you know? But kids grow up with this all around them. Violence becomes normalized. So in a situation where there are few avenues for advancement, uh, astonishingly, 80% or more of the kids who grow up in these neighborhoods get out of them. They go to school, they get jobs, some go to college. More than 80% statistically overcome that situation. But kids like Tana, who had no parents, except for the mother who was out on the street selling drugs, schooling him on how to sell drugs on the corner from when he was like six years old. Uh, he has no family, he has no community, he has no school, he has no opportunities, really, to advance himself. And yet he's very capable. He's very smart. He's ambitious. He's someone who other kids find impressive and will follow. And he can go out on the corner and make $100 a night. So at a certain point, a lot of these kids um, take what I call the greased path. It's right there in front of them. There's a certain amount of pride in the neighborhood in these successful illegal op uh, operations that go on. Uh, the, the kids who get involved in it are, when they're teenagers, which he was, are heroes to, the, to, uh, to their fellows. Uh, they are the, the stars, they're the ghetto stars. And so this, is, this has a real pull. Unfortunately, you know, when you get caught up in what they call the game, which is selling these drugs, violence is a part of it. If you're on the street corner selling drugs and somebody comes by and steals your stash, you can't report it to the police. You have to be able to uh, defend your turf. And defending your turf means you have to have a gun. And at some point you have to use that gun. So where violence is normalized, where violence is a way of doing business, kids like Tana find themselves uh, mastering their environment. Kids adapt to the world they know. And he was an enormous success in his own little neighborhood. But sadly, that meant he, uh, he was killing people. But I should also say he, was, he had accepted the idea that he would probably be killed himself. And that's the flip side of that, too, is that these right. kids develop the notion that they really don't have any future at all. They're probably going to be dead. And they are, so they don't really think, where am I going to be when I'm in my 20s or in my 30s? You know, it's just they're living for the moment, and that's, that's why they get caught up in it. Mark, um, you never got to talk in person to Tana, correct? Mm -hmm. But um, when you read the book, you'll find that, the, that Mark's ability to describe him both physically and spiritually is really uh, vivid and detailed and colorful. So how did you do it? Well, you know, I've always found, you know, when, when you're assigned to write a profile of someone, <laughs> uh, most reporters, I think, instinctively feel like that they need to set up an interview with that person. And that's a good thing to do. It's useful. It's not the most useful thing, though. It's not the best thing. The best thing you can do are find people who know that person and get them to tell you stories about that person. And you end up with, instead of a, a very uh, mono song about that individual, you end up with a stereoscopic view. And the great thing about it, too, is that uh, I think you develop a more realistic assessment of someone. Uh, because everybody, when they talk about themselves, 
I'm doing it right now. You know, <laughs> you know, are selling themselves to an extent. You know, they're they're explaining themselves in the way that they see themselves. You get a more honest and often much more interesting perspective on someone by talking to somebody who who knows them well. And I will say, even though Montana uh, was not uh, able and willing to talk to me because of his legal predicament, uh, he did give his sister Shanika. Uh, permission to talk to me, and I'm telling you, Shanika was just terrific. <laughs> that, that woman can talk. <laughs> Mark, tell us a little bit about um, being on the streets in Sandtown and Winchester these days. What is it like, and how does it compare with um, comparable neighborhoods in Philadelphia in terms of housing, retail, children, drug corners, etc.? Well, I think things are a lot closer together in Philadelphia. It's a much more densely populated city. Sandtown is surprisingly open, so that uh, there are lots of vacant lots and lots of big, wide intersections. So that is one of the things visually that's striking about it. Um, it's also empty. That, that spaciousness gives you a sense of how little is going on there. And, but there, you'll find you know, pockets of people either hanging around on a corner or out in front of a house, uh, but not general traffic moving on the street. And there is, I noticed, and because I'm white, I'm sure, it's, and I'm old, um, that there's a lot of curiosity about what's this old white guy doing in our neighborhood, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm sure a lot of speculation, but people are very nice. Uh, they they um, are happy to help you out and, and talk to you for the most part. And, I never had any trouble with anybody. When you did your reporting, did you go by yourself? Yes. Yeah. And, and um, in terms of degree of threat, how did this compare with being in Mogadishu? Oh, nothing, nothing <laughs> like it. <laughs> Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? For well, Mogadishu uh, was a mistake, first of all. I, if I'd known what I was going to go getting into, I wouldn't have gone. Um, but, I mean, that city was just uh, a nightmare. Um, there was no government there at all. It was in a state of complete anarchy. There were different factions fighting for different sectors of the city. So there would be fighting going on every day and every night. Uh, if you go to the hospital in, in Mogadishu, there would be kids, 13, 14 year old, you know, all shot up from the night before. Uh, anywhere I went in Mogadishu, I had to go with an armed contingent. So I had a uh, a group of um, gunmen, and they would guard me you know, wherever I went. And any, anywhere I went, I would be mobbed, um, usually within about 10 minutes or 15 minutes after I got there. And it got ugly in a few cases. Because it was so peculiar uh, in Mogadishu at that time for there to be a, a Caucasian even on the streets of the city because of their recent history, with the UN and with the United States and the fighting that had happened there, there remained a lot of hostility toward Americans. Um, so it was, a, uh, to be honest, a really frightening place for me to be. And I was really glad when I left. Um, nothing like that. And you know, I've always felt that the level of danger you know, ascribed to neighborhoods in Philadelphia or in Baltimore are way exaggerated. I understand why people are afraid of them and why they feel the way they do, but um, I've, never, I've never felt terribly threatened, actually, being out on the streets of the city. Nor have I. Um, when I was reporting in some of the uh, highest crime areas, I was always uh, wearing a coat and tie, and I assumed people thought I was either an FBI agent or a detective. And um, once they realized why I was there to write about civil rights, I was welcomed. I know that when I was in East Baltimore, uh, where Hopkins is, if, if I was you know, nicely dressed, people would call me doctor. <laughs> Can you stop by doctor? My mother really needs to see a doctor. I said, no, not a doctor. Yeah, right. <laughs> Mark, going back to uh, Tana for a moment, yeah. um, the epigraph that begins this book is from Thomas Hobbes writing in the Leviathan. Right. And I want to read it and then have you describe how this relates to Tana in each and every way. Um, it's, it's in Old English, so uh, listen carefully. So that in the nature of man, 
we find three principal causes of quarrel. First, competition. Secondly, diffidence in parens self-defense. Thirdly, glory. The first maketh man invade for gain. The second, for safety. And the third, for reputation, for trifles. How does that apply to our protagonist here? Well, when you live in a world where you know, your <clears throat> reputation is tremendously important, um, anyone who even inadvertently insults you is taking their life into their hands. And, you know, Tana, I think, grew up in a world like that, where in order to be taken seriously, he had to frighten people. People had to be afraid of him. People don't scare that easily in a neighborhood where people are routinely shot down and killed. So, and not until you really start killing people do people take you <laughs> very, very seriously. Uh, and then there's this added element which relates to this reputation, and that is social media. Um, unlike you know, kids growing up in a neighborhood like Sandtown 30 or 40 years ago who might have had a big reputation on the block, uh, Montana's group, which call themselves TTG, Train, Train to Go, were making very sophisticated music videos of themselves. I mean, really good. And they had a rap artist who would rap, and then they would film themselves enacting some of their crimes while these were being rapped. And these videos were getting hundreds of thousands of likes online. So you can imagine if you're 16 years old and you're the star of, uh, in your neighborhood and you're also a star on a video that's being viewed by people all over the country and all over the world that your head starts to outrace everything else. I mean, the, the idea, I think that it's that that is for a teenage mind almost like a drug uh, that desire to achieve uh, notoriety or celebrity and there weren't too many other ways for somebody like uh, Tana to do it but I think that's an element that I wasn't expecting to find and I think really had a big role in making Von Hanna and his group as violent as they were one of the things um, I think you'll like about this book is that it really um, examines Tana's life and life on the streets and law enforcement from every possible angle. And it's clear, Mark, that you had um, superb cooperation from some uh, Baltimore police officers mm -hmm. or retirees from the Justice Department and others. Tell us about how that happened. Well, the reason that uh, you know I stumbled on this story to begin with is that uh, I have a friend named Matt Bai who writes a column for the Washington Post, and he's good friends with a guy named Jonathan Lenzner, who right now is the chief of staff for the FBI, but who four or five years ago was the first assistant U.S. attorney for Maryland. And so I don't know whether Matt and Jonathan got talking some night about how all the interesting things that the feds were doing and. Baltimore to try to deal with rising levels of violence. But Matt called me one day and he said, uh, would you be interested in going down to talk to my friend Jonathan about what they're doing in Baltimore? I guess thinking, we never even talked about it, but I presume because I write for the Atlantic periodically that they were thinking maybe I would be interested in writing about you know what they were doing down there. So I went, uh, just because as a reporter, Bill vouched for this, you don't get too many invitations to go sit down with the U.S. <laughs> attorney and talk about what's going on. And so I went down and I really enjoyed meeting Jonathan and Robert Herr, who was then the U.S. attorney. And they were explaining to me all the innovative methods that they were using, some of which appear in this book. But I asked them for an example. And they said, well, the first example we have is this group called TTG in West Baltimore, led by this kid named Montana Baronet, great name. And so I said, well, tell me more about that, you know? So they told me a little bit about him, and I said, well, I'm really interested in that. You know, that's what interests me. I want to understand these kids. And, and part of the story is obviously how the uh, city police and the feds cooperated to bring this, take this group off the street. But to me, the big story was really who are, who are these guys, and why are they the way they are, and, why are things the way they are? 
Well, um, now we're going to have some questions from the people out there. And in order to create a little momentum, I uh, arranged for the first two questioners. So in the back, I think we have Mike Sielski. Mike, there you are. And uh, Mike is a uh, hey, Mike. terrific Inquirer columnist. And um, if you have a chance, you should read his book about Kobe Bryant, which I give an A plus to. And um, also read his column today about the Flyers and what they need to do to uh, revive their fortunes. So Mike, you're on. First of all, terrific presentation, guys. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to break a cardinal rule of journalism and ask a two-part question, Mark. <laughs> um, number one, what techniques or qualities do you have and employ to get sources to trust you and to open up to you the way that they do? And then, kind of as a corollary to that, given the fragmenting of media nowadays and in some quarters the decline of object objective journalism, have you found it harder over time to get sources to trust you because they're going to view you as the media more skeptically? Well, both good questions, Mike. Thanks for coming out tonight. I noticed that the, <clears throat> I think the Phillies are playing tonight. I don't know if the Flyers are, so very nice of you to take the night off <clears throat> to come visit us. You know, the, the getting, pardon me? This is how special you are. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're getting, you know, people ask me about this often, you know, how'd you get somebody to talk to you? And the answer is most often I showed up. Uh, you know, I've, I think people overestimate how difficult that is. Um, people want to tell their stories. If you talk to a defense lawyer, um, she'll tell you that the biggest problem that she has with her clients is getting them to shut up. You know, as soon as they get arrested, what they want to do is they want to explain everything. You know, like I really didn't mean to do it, or I, I, I had a good reason for what I did, and, or whatever. And you have to try to get them to shut up. So very often, you know, if I'm trying to get somebody to talk to me and they, and they're reluctant, you know, I'm trying to figure out, well, you know, why are they reluctant? What are they afraid of? And part of that, I think, is sometimes you fail, and sometimes it's just getting them to trust you, and to get them to trust you, you just are, are as honest as you can be. You know, I, I always say to people, I used to say this to the athletes I covered when I worked for the Enquirer, you're the expert, you know. I don't, I don't know anything about how to play cornerback on the Philadelphia Eagles. If you don't explain it to me, I, I don't have any idea. And I think people respond to that. It's the truth. Uh, so that's, you know, I think what works for me. Um, I think today, uh, if I were covering a beat, um, I think the bigger problem is trying to f find somebody to employ you <laughs> to do the work, you know? Um, and people will judge you by the publication that you're working for. If you're lucky enough to work for a great newspaper, then you get credit you know, for that. Harder when, when you don't. Easier for me because I've been doing this for so long. Very often the people who I interview, not always, but very often, especially if it's somebody in the military or somebody in the police world or politics, or you know, they, they'll recognize my name and, and I get a certain amount of uh, uh, respect for, for the work that I've done in the past. But I, do, I think, you know, I find that the whole media landscape is terrifying. Uh, and I'm really glad that I'm not starting out down, down that path. I, I, and, and I speak both as someone who spent a lifetime in journalism and as a consumer of journalism, that it's terrifying to me that it's so difficult to believe uh, what you're reading or, or what you're seeing and how hard it is, even for somebody who has worked their whole life in the field, to sort through the propaganda and come you know, to some information that you can really believe. Bill, you've managed to win two Pulitzer Prizes getting people to talk to you who you wouldn't think would ever talk to you. How, how do you do it? Um, Mark, your advice is uh, sage. Um, and, and Mike Sielski, you already know how to do it because um, you've developed great sources. Um, but I, I'd say the two things that are most important, number one, uh, live up to the letter and the spirit of every promise you make, come hell or high water. If you promise not to write something and your editor's pressuring you, tell the editor, no way, period. Um, secondly, I think it helps when you write great stories 
that are accurate, thorough, fair, and that have an impact. And when you do that, the momentum creates momentum. Uh, my daughter is a reporter at the Washington Post, and the one thing I told her to do when she starts a beat is look for a really good, solid story, a valid story, that coincides with the interests of someone you're covering. Not, not a puff piece, but a story that's important, that's interesting and timely, and then do that story better than anyone else in the world could do the story. <laughs> you do that, and you're going to develop a source for a long time. Right. So that's my and, you know, And also, Mike, you'll, you'll like this, because you'll know what it's like. Uh, but I think being a sports reporter prepares you really well for dealing with um, people who have a disdainful attitude toward journalists. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. <laughs> well, um, our second questioner is Kenny Brownstein. Kenny, fire away, Gridley. I enjoyed your talk. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, so, as originally starting out as a journalist, how would you say that this has affected your style as an author, uh, as compared to someone who's an author who didn't have that uh, that that profession before they became an author? Well, it's a really good question, you know, and I think that uh, it's shaped all of my uh, authorship. All of my books are nonfiction books. I think if I had never had the experience of being a reporter, I probably would have tried to stab off into fiction at some point. I still can't find any better stories than the ones that are true. Uh, <laughs> but I think, too, that, you know, I, I spent so many years um, working at the Inquirer and learning how yeah, to be a reporter and knowing what questions to ask and who to seek out and you know how to dig and how to you know really think, sink your teeth into a story um, those are all learned skills and i probably would never have been able to learn that on my own i had you know terrific editors who would hand things back to me and say you didn't do enough work you know you didn't talk to enough people or you didn't ask the right questions on this, or this isn't fair, what you've written. And you know, you get treated like that long enough, you start to learn. <laughs> and, and so I, I think that you know, everything that I do as an author is shaped by my experience as, as a reporter. Uh, my question for you, Mark, is um, when you heard from the assistant U.S. Attorney and the U.S. Attorney about Montana, and you thought, that's a story I want to pursue. What did you do next? And what was it about what happened next that persuaded you that you were on the right trail? Well, good question, Liz. I, you know, I think the first thing I did was get the um, transcript of the like two-month-long trial, uh, and I started reading it. And that gave me, you know, the who were the people who showed up to, as witnesses, you know, for the prosecution and for the defense? You know, who were the uh, lawyers who defended these guys? Uh, and so though, all those, for me, are leads. And so not only are people showing up in court and telling their stories, but I'm getting uh, um, arrows pointing me. You need to talk to this person. You need to talk to that person. And then I wrote to all of the uh, defendants in this case and, and in prison and asked them, told them what I was doing, asked them if I could come visit with them, um, if I could talk to anybody in their family. And some of them, like Montana, responded. And I ended up having a brief correspondence with him where he felt safe enough just telling me, yeah, he would let his sister and his stepmother and others talk to me. And you know, one thing leads to another. Uh, every person, the end of every interview, I always say, who else should I talk to? And that always leads me to an like, almost endless number of potential sources. Uh, my question is a follow-up of what you just said, and that is, when you start, you have this idea, you met this US attorney, and then you start your story. How long does it take you, on average, to finish the story? And when you know it's done, and <laughs> what do you feel like you didn't include, or what, how do you handle that? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, it depends. The length of time depends. I mean, Bill mentioned earlier you know, my book about the Battle of Hue in Vietnam. I spent five to six years working on that, several trips to Vietnam. Um, some projects are just enormous and daunting. Uh, this, I really, when I started, I, I didn't think it was going to take me all that long. It ended up taking me three years. 
COVID intervened, uh, which made it kind of difficult to do some of the reporting I wanted. Um, but I was able to do a lot of stuff on, on the phone. Um, I think that the trick to knowing when you're done is the central task of composing a story. And it was the thing when I worked with reporters at the Inquirer, and I said some of them had such a hard time um, crafting. There were tremendous reporters, but trying to shape something into a story was very difficult for them. With me, I begin thinking about the structure of the story I'm writing the day I start reporting. I'm literally jotting notes to myself saying, you know, what is this story going to look like? You know, wh where does it begin? Where's the middle? Where's the end? And that keeps changing all the time. But that's a habit that went back to my earliest days as a daily newspaper reporter, where I would start working on a story. Generally, then I would work on a story for a day, you know, maybe a few <laughs> hours. And you never know, you know, who, who you're going to get to talk to you, whether someone will return your phone call, whether you show up at somebody's office, they'll, they'll let you come in and ask questions. So you never quite know what you're going to get, but the deadline looms. And so you have to always be thinking, and I would take my, my notebook, these thin notepads, which I scratched all my notes on, and flip it upside down and draw little outlines for myself. If, if I have to write this story right now, you know, what do I know? And wh so what's my lead? You know, and where, how am I going to end the story? And so that habit, which now looking back on it seems so simple, you know, when you're working on a story for five or six years, that, that is something that guides you. You know, as long as you are continually thinking about the structure of the story, not only does it tell you um, what you need to find out, you, you realize, oh, I'm going to have to devote a certain piece of what I'm writing on this part of the story. I need to find out more about that part of the story. But maybe even more importantly, it starts to tell you what you don't need to find out any more about. And I can give you an example. When I wrote Black Hawk Down, that book centers on an 18-hour battle. And yet that group, Task Force Ranger, went on six missions in Mogadishu, five of them before this big battle. And really interesting things happened in these earlier missions. So when I started out, I, they were tell, all these guys I was interviewing were telling me about their previous missions and what happened here, what happened there. And I'm listening. But at a certain point, I realized, I'm going to write about these 18 hours. So at most, what happened on mission number two is going to be a paragraph or a sentence in the story that I'm writing. So I don't need to know any more about that. But I do need to know everything I can find out about those 18 hours. So that's, in a nutshell, I think, how I do it. This is, by I the way, my, my book club. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an avid reader. This is my Kenneth Square book club. <laughs> um, we all know the adage about success being perspiration and inspiration. And what you've described is a lot of the perspiration. But when I hear you talk about what happened with the U.S. Attorney and the inspiration, I'm going to jump over to Malcolm Gladwell and blink. And to me, there's a fair bit of intuition in there that you're, you're jumping onto that. And even when you're describing Black Hawk Down, you're recognizing that there's a kernel here that's better than the others. And right. it may be scant evidence of that. H have you ever explored the role of intuition in your success? That's a really good question. Yeah, I will say this. I don't know if this falls directly in the category of intuition. But I think that the stories that end up becoming books for me, and oftentimes even those that end up being magazine stories, emerge because th it's something I've always wanted to do. And in, the, in this book, I mean, I've always wanted to understand, you know, these neighborhoods, kids who live like this, what it, how are their lives shaped? Why is this happening? You know, the, this violence in cities. So that has always been there. So sometimes the moment of inspiration comes when somebody opens a door and you realize that door leads to something that I'm really interested in. And I think I might be able to answer some questions if I go through that door. And for, for Black Hawk Down, what it was is I grew up, like many people my age, uh, watching war movies, um, war TV shows. Uh, my dad was in the Navy in World War II. My uncles all fought in various 
theaters of, the, of World War II. And I grew up with the assumption as a kid that someday I would go to war, that I would be a soldier and go to war. And so as a child, as a young man, the concept of what would that experience be like? What, what would it be like to actually be in combat? You know, I think when I stumbled on the story of Black Hawk Down, that door opened. And I realized now I can actually write a story about what that experience is, is like. So that's the best I can do. Thank you very much to both of you. And here's a big question for both of you. What do you see as the future of journalism that's being, and writing, is being shaped by artificial intelligence? I'll okay. <laughs> oh, Bill's Mark, more Mark, of a boss than Mark, I Mark is deferring to me. <laughs> um, I, I think that there is um, great potential in artificial intelligence and also great danger. And I'll give you an area where I think it could be very valuable. Um, I'm a sports fan, like Mark, and um, if I'm away from home and I want to find out about how the Phillies are doing or how the Sixers are doing, um, I, I no longer go to the Inquirer. I go to ESPN because I can push a button and find out the box score and play-by-play. -play. Um, I lament the fact that you can't go to the Inquirer and get that same information. Um, I'm virtually sure even though I'm not much, not too uh, advanced technologically, that with a good IT department and some investment, the Inqu Inquirer could easily replicate what ESPN is doing and have lots of people go to the Inquirer website rather than ESPN. Um, I think there's a danger in um, abdicating um, reporting on the street to machines um, because you lose nuance, you lose subtlety, and you lose expertise. So I think there's uh, a trade-off, but, but I'm an advocate for using it for data, uh, for access to court files, and things like that. Um, I think that AI will never replace clever, insightful writing. Uh, human beings will have that edge, I hope, at least as long as I'm alive. Um, and I also think, by definition, Anything that your AI software comes up with is something that's already been reported. If you want to find out something new in the world, you have to go look for it. And you have to ask questions. And you have to go where the story is. And um, that's what reporters do. And, and I don't think AI is going to be able to do that. Um, you know, that what AI does is it scans everything that's already been um, posted online, organizes it, maybe very cleverly packages it really well. But if you're someone who reads avidly and pays attention to the news, it's not very often that it's going to surprise you. It's real reporting that surprises you. Yeah, I think that um, you know, in terms of investigative reporting and um, analytical reporting, um, it re really requires a human being, meaning a reporter, to see someone face to face and um, ask questions and ascertain whether they're telling the truth or lying or omitting things. A machine can't do that. Um, one of my favorite interviews ever um, involved a Philadelphia mayor, Wilson Good, and uh, 24 free suits that he received. And uh, it's, at first, I didn't think it was much of a story, but the suits were worth about $500 each, uh, $13,000 altogether at a time when his salary was $55,000. And I knew Wilson, I respected him, and I went to see him and I asked him about the suits. And this was his answer. Listen carefully. I never asked for any free suits. I never expected to get any free suits. And Bill, whenever I was billed, I paid. <laughs> uh, I thought I was listening carefully. But because I trusted him, I, I reported what he said. Um, and the next day, someone from the uh, a federal law enforcement official called me up and said, using some profanity, which I won't repeat, he is a blanking liar. I said, well, how do you know? He said, come see me. And there were 24 invoices for men's suits, none of which had ever been sent to the mayor, none of which had ever been paid. He wrote a check that night 
that I interviewed him to pay for the suits. <laughs> so a machine isn't going to do that. Only someone like Mark Bowden is going to do that. <laughs> Five or six contributing factors to this the, the situation. Yeah. Do you now emphasize some of them more than you did before or less? Yes. Uh, first of all, I mean, even though I lived in Baltimore as a teenager and went to college there and worked as a reporter there for a while, uh, I learned more about Baltimore and Maryland writing this book than in any other experience I've ever had because I went back and read the history of the city and I read books about the way the city was developed and I, I gained a deeper understanding of it. I also think what I learned um, gave me an even starker appreciation for how much of an apartheid past I had. You know, and I was aware of it. Um, and I remember when I went to South Africa for the first time in the 1980s, early 1980s, when apartheid was still in place. And I was shocked to see signs saying white race group only, you know, on beaches or in front of restaurants and things like that. And then on reflection, I thought, how different is that really from the world that I grew up in? And so a lot of it, I think, I ascribe to just this is the way people are, this is the way that you know, the culture of the city has evolved. And then as I researched it, I realized, no, this was very deliberate, that our governments, you know, our, the city government, the county government, both worked with people with money uh, to create this apartheid city and enforced it. I mean, even back in 1965, when I was growing up in Baltimore County, if a realtor showed a home to a black family, it had to be reported to the police. He had to tell the police. This was in 1965. So this was, that was when I was 14, 15 years old, about the time that I moved to Baltimore. So I have become um, even more conscious of the tremendous injustice uh, that has shaped cities like Baltimore or Philadelphia. And I think that the idea that this is somehow over time going to work itself out is, is unjust it's in itself, that we have an obligation, especially those of us who have benefited by this arrangement, to say it's wrong and to try to point out that it needs to be changed or things will not get better. All right, I think we're going to cease and desist here. Um, thank you very much for uh, coming. Make sure you go out and get this book in the front. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.